Hello RUSD, my name is David Venny and I am an instructional coach at Warwick High School. Today's On Demand PD is on a topic called Total Participation Techniques, or TPTs for short. Um, these techniques are basically structures or frameworks that you use within your classroom. Um, in my opinion, they can be utilized in any content or subject area. And the goal basically is to get every student involved in your lesson and uh, actively learning, which is something that I think most teachers dream of. So Total Participation Techniques is actually based off of a book uh, written by Persida Himalay and William Himalay. Um, there's actually two editions of it. The first edition is the book on the left that's kind of teal colored and the second edition is the blue book on the right. Um, both books are outstanding. If you're looking to save some money, I'd encourage you to get the first edition um, as the second edition only has a couple of other techniques in it that are different from the first one. But either one would uh, give you a good grounding in how to incorporate total participation techniques in your classroom. In the book, they give this graph uh, discussing higher order and lower order thinking and the amount of participation that your class has. So when we um, are designing our lessons or delivering instruction, we want to try to be shooting for quadrant four, where we are forcing our students to have a high cognitive load and a high amount of participation. Ultimately, uh, we would like the majority of our lesson to kind of hover in this quadrant four area. Um, is the whole thing there? Probably not. I mean, I, when I, I was teaching, I certainly, you know, would be in other quadrants of this graph. But ultimately, the goal is to try to keep our students in quadrant four, where we have high cognition and high participation occurring. And that's what TPTs are designed to do, is to try to put your students in that fourth quadrant so that they are having to think really hard and uh, all, everyone is participating in the process. So the, the process of a TPT is the, um, the authors of these books basically encourage you to think of yourself as throwing a stone into a pond. And this graphic is supposed to represent that. The stone is thrown and then from that stone, water ripples outwards. When you throw the stone, you are basically lobbing a question to your students that is higher order in nature. And it starts with the first layer of the ripple is that all students respond individually to that higher order prompt. So you give them some think time, some time to process the question and come up with their own answer. Uh, generally for me, that's between 30 seconds and maybe two minutes of time that they have to individually respond to a higher order prompt. From there, the ripple expands further and students share their responses with uh, either small groups or in pairs. And during that process, basically what the students are doing is very given the opportunity to um, A, practice their speaking and listening skills, but probably even more important than that is B, they're able to actually run their idea past a fellow student to see whether or not if their idea is actually uh, something that's a good one and kind of refine their answer and their thought process. One of the things that I love about TPTs is it, it takes away some of the um, social stress, if you will, that occurs in the classroom when questions are asked. And one of the things I always tried to avoid as a teacher was having students feel stupid in front of their peers. This is a way in that small group setting for students to run their ideas past their peers and they can get feedback like, oh yeah, that's actually a good idea and maybe we should change that in some form or fashion. And it kind of eliminates that 28 eyes staring at one person responding to a question and then they might get it wrong or say something that just doesn't quite fit and then they feel really bad about that bad answer. Uh, whereas in, in the smaller student share out response in small group setting, uh, it alleviates some of that, that possibility. The third ripple then is to have volunteers or selected students share with the whole class what they discussed in their small groups or in their pairs. And that is an opportunity for then the whole class to be hearing from uh, their different groups. So one of the things in the book that they talk about is avoiding asking your class the question, who can tell me? Uh, so for instance, who can tell me why the sky is blue? Uh, questions like that that are just out there for one person to respond to um, are things that we want to try to avoid. We really want to have our students respond individually first, 
then share their responses in a small group or a pair setting, and then expand out further where we have the whole class discussion. So we really want to avoid doing the who can tell me type prompt, and then only one person is responding to that question. Because then if we think about that in a classroom of 30 students, as soon as we call on Johnny to answer that question, what are the other 29 students doing? They may be listening, but now they're off the hook for having to respond to that question. They're safe. And we want to try to basically get everyone involved, actively involved in the lesson. So now I'm just going to go through, that's basically the, the, the structure. It's nothing really like rocket science going on with TPTs, but I'm just going to give you a couple examples that I found um, to be beneficial and high impact in the classroom that you may want to try um, in your room. Um, but like I said, the, the book has many, many more that you can go to and, and refer to that and, and pull out for your different types of TPT activities that you do in your classroom. But this one's a real simple one. It's called a quick draw. Basically allow your students to demonstrate and understand a concept through drawing. So it, it helps to if you have artistic students or students who, who really like that uh, visual type of uh, representation of things, this is a great activity for them. So how you do it, select a big idea in your lesson and have your students create a visual of that concept. So they make that visual and then have students share and explain their image with a partner. So then we go through that ripple process. So you, you might say, give me a, a visual of, uh, in my example, I did sustainability. Draw an image that represents sustainability. So you'd have your students draw that image, give them you know 30 seconds, two minutes, whatever you feel like is adequate time for them to draw that image. And then they would go and share that image with a group, a small group or just a pair and then have that class share out at the end, so following that ripple format. Another TPT would be something called a quick write. Students are basically provided with a prompt and they're given a specific amount of time to write about that prompt individually. And then you follow that up with either a turn and talk or some other sharing technique so that you can then have your students kind of, again, following that ripple format that they answer individually, then they share it with a pair or group, and then they share it with the whole class. Okay, super simple things that, um, you know, just we need to leverage in the classroom to get all of our students actively learning. So uh, this was my example of a quick write prompt. What's your opinion on net neutrality? Obviously, this may not uh, tie into your content area, but this is just an example of uh, such a quick write prompt. Another really fun one is something called Chalkboard Splash. What they can basically be used is to summarize uh, an activity that you may have done. So we just we just talked about that quick write activity. Uh, what's your opinion on net neutrality? Um, what you then could do is after you've had that discussion, that class uh, that class dialogue around that prompt, then you could have all of your students write a one sentence summary of their quick write prompt on the board. And so all of a sudden you have all of this these prompts. Uh, excuse me, all of these summaries written on the board for students to then view. And you could then have them do something like this where you have them analyze the responses for three things. Give them this little chart on the bottom here. Um, where they analyze what are the similarities that they are seeing on the chalkboard, what are the differences, and what are some surprises. So they would organize their, their classmates' responses into these three different categories. All of these activities, hopefully you're starting to see, um, generally are easy to do, uh, involve very low preparation, and um, are going to engage the cognitive load on students, are going to encourage them to have to think um, hard about the question, uh, to actually put some thought into it, and uh, generally it can be kind of fun because there's a social aspect to it as well, that you're having them interact and mingle with their, uh, with their peers. The final one that I'm going to talk about today uh, is something called the debate carousel. And basically, in this activity, students are uh, given a question that re requires them to provide some evidence and then support their position with that evidence and actually think about the opposing viewpoint. So certain certain TPTs are really good for you know um, certain prompts and other times they're not so much. So this debate carousel may not be such a good one to do say in a math class uh, per se if, if you have something that is like very cut and dry with the answer but if you want to talk about something that you can kind of form an opinion around then the debate carousel might be a good one for you. But basically what you do with this is you arrange your students into groups of fours and then ask a yes or no questions question that requires students to analyze the issue so having that opinion and having to actually provide some evidence to support that opinion um, and what they get is they get this handout uh, let me pull that handout up 
So here's the handout. It's basically just four squares. Uh, in the first square, they write their opinion and provide a reason why they think the way that they do about the, the question that you provided with them. So they take a moment, jot down their opinion, and, and explain why in box one. Then what they would do is they would trans or trade the paper in a clockwise fashion to the person next to them. And the person next to them would then read the response in box one and then add another reason that supports their partner's viewpoint. Whatever their opinion doesn't really matter so much. What it is that they have to do is actually provide information that would support the opinion of the owner of the paper. So they would write that down in box two. Then the papers get rotated again. And in box three, the person who now just received the paper looks at boxes one and two and now refutes what was written in boxes one and two with some support. So provide the counter argument to whatever is written in these two boxes. Whether or not they agree with it doesn't actually matter. They're just practicing thinking about um, uh, positions from different uh, viewpoints. And then one more trade of the paper, one more pass around the fourth box. They read the comments in all three boxes, and then that person states their individual opinion and provides reasons why they held that opinion. And then the paper heads back to the original owner. So just a, a cool activity to do uh, with um, something uh, with a topic that may have multiple viewpoints and you want your students to really dig into kind of both sides of a position or both sides of an argument, this is a, a good TPT to incorporate in your classroom. So that was very short and sweet, um, but again, here are the two books that I mentioned earlier in this webcast. Uh, the second edition is more expensive than the first edition. The first one uh, you can get off of Amazon for maybe like seven or eight dollars. The second edition is more in the twenty twenty five dollar range. Personally, uh, both of them are very good, but I think you can get the first edition and get tons of great information on how to run TPTs in your classroom um, and save yourself um, some money by not having to buy the second edition. I would say that total participation techniques are great for really any any grades, probably starting around third grade all the way to uh, seniors in high school. So this is something that I think could be leveraged in a lot of different classrooms and a lot of different subject areas because it's so general and so broad. Um, again, my name is David Venny and I'm an instructional coach at Horlick High School. I thank you so much for tuning in. Have a great rest of your day.